Well, what a great start with Administrator Bose kicking things off here in Billings, Montana for the Greater Northwest Passenger Rail Summit. Thank you all for attending in person here in Billings and for all of you out there either watching this stream live or uh, otherwise connected via Microsoft Teams participating virtually. I mentioned earlier there will be a number of opportunities to acknowledge the many folks who are working behind the scenes to make this event a reality. And I wanna make sure that we acknowledge some of those right out of the chute now. First off, before I do that though, one of the methods of uh, garnering the resources that we need to do the advocacy work, to do the alliance building work, to do the administration work of the Big Sky Passenger Rail Authority is right behind these dividers. We have an auction going as we speak with some great items out there. If you want to bid on those items, you can do so by going uh, electronically to the Summit webpage or to the Big Sky Passenger Rail Authority website, which has a link to the auction. One of the items that I really want to highlight for folks, and, and please take a look at it, it's a map that's been especially created, an artistic map especially created for the Big Sky Passenger Rail Authority and for our work here in the greater Northwest region. And there it is on the screen in front of you. I'm sure you've seen Explorer maps before. Their maps appear in places like Glacier National Park, Yellowstone National Park, other places around the country. They're beautiful uh, hand-drawn images that include artistic elements along with uh, more traditional mapping elements in a map. And so on this map, you'll see both a couple of the routes that we are so focused on in terms of restoration, uh, the North Coast Hiawatha, the Pioneer Route, you'll see existing Amtrak routes, and then also aspirational routes that might take a while to uh, get into place, but certainly ought to be on the table for consideration like what once existed, connectivity between Denver, Colorado, and Billings, Montana, or Salt Lake City, Utah and Butte, Montana, and the points beyond. So please do check out the auction outside, uh, these dividers. Uh, I would like to give a round of applause and uh, ask for a round of applause to Greg and Chris Robitaille of Explorer Maps who created this especially for this event. In the slideshow that you see rotating uh, between sessions, you will see lists of the sponsors for this event. Please take note, I'm not going to read every sponsor right now, but please take note of who those sponsors are. If you run into any of them at this summit event, give them, uh, their, uh, give them your thanks because it's because of their generosity that we've been able to put this event on, which as you can imagine is no small undertaking. Another element that I want to draw your attention to is something that the Big Sky Passenger Rail Authority has kicked off as part of garnering those financial resources to do the work that we are doing. And that is our business and association partnership program. You have materials in your uh, welcome bags that you received when you registered about this program. You will also see some of those same materials flashed on the screen between sessions. And I wanna draw a special attention to three of our founding members, three of our founding business partnership program members who are, uh, I think at least two of them are with us today. So uh, I wanna give special thanks to KLJ Engineering. Matt Smith, I, are you out there? Do you wanna stand up? Thank, thank you, Matt. And uh, we have Siemens Mobility, Steve Rocher. Uh, Steve, are you out there? Thanks, Steve. Joining us perhaps virtually, but not in the room, are representatives from Clearwater Credit Union in Missoula, based out of Missoula, Montana, Jack Lawson and Paul Herendine, who also, uh, out of their generosity, are supporting our efforts significantly. So how about a round of applause for Clearwater Credit Union? Finally, I just want to say uh, thank you to Dan Bucks, uh, who is uh, the chair of our fundraising committee for the Rail Authority, who has wrangled this uh, 
and, and done a lot of work with this auction out here with uh, our business and association partnerships. Thank you, Dan, for all of your work. And as a continuation of our last presentation uh, and a segue from Administrator Bowes to other FRA, critical FRA staff who are joining us for the entirety of this event uh, this Monday and Tuesday, I'm uh, pleased to introduce Lai Lytelt and Katie List from FRA to talk to us a little bit more about what all they are uh, working on and how that connects with our greater Northwest region. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Lyle Lytell. I'm a community planner with the Federal Railroad Administration and our Project Engineering and Transportation Planning Division. I'm joined today by my colleague, Katie List, who is also a community planner, but in our Passenger Rail and Policy and Oversight Division. And today we've been asked to talk about two uh, inner city passenger rail efforts led by FRA. First is the Corridor Identification Development Program that you heard from a little bit from Amit about, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail about the overview of the program and where we are with it. And then secondly, I know of uh, extreme interest from this group is the Amtrak Daily Long Distance Service Study, where we're basically we'll provide an overview of the study itself. Uh, we're gonna review the draft scope of work and discuss potential engagement strategies on how to move forward. So, quarter ID program, or the Corridor Identification Development Program, establishes a comprehensive inner city passenger rail planning framework that will help guide future federal project development work and capital investments. The establishment of the Corridor ID Program represents a major milestone in over five decades of federal work on inner city passenger rail development. Unlike previous federal inner city passenger rail planning efforts, the Corridor ID Program establishes a formal framework to guide the future development of inner city passenger rail throughout the country and is intended to support sustained long-term development efforts. And under the program, FRA is required to solicit proposals for implementing new or improving existing inner city passenger rail service and select proposals for development under the program. When selecting proposals, FRA must consider 14 different selection criteria identified in the statute. And for each selected proposal, we must partner with the entity that submitted the proposal to prepare or update an existing service development plan or an SDP, which must include a corridor project inventory and establish a prioritized pipeline of projects that may be implemented with funding provided under FRAs and potentially other federal capital investment financial assistance programs. Eligibility for the program is quite broad. From a quarter level, we, we are looking at things that include both short distance services, so anything that's over, under 750 miles, um, along with increases in the frequency of long distance services and restoring service over any route formerly operated by Amtrak. Additionally, the eligibility <coughs> for entities is quite broad. It's not just state DOTs, but nearly any kind of public entity with a role in transportation planning, or transportation, I should say, including Amtrak, groups of states, entities implementing interstate compacts, regional passenger rail authorities, regional planning organizations, political subdivisions of states, federally recognized Indian tribes, and other public entities. And so in implementing the program, FRA has gone ahead and introduced a two-part approach. First, on May 13th, 2022, we formally established the program uh, in the Federal Register via a formal notice. And that notice basically provides some high-level information about the program itself, including the framework for the program, ties together the statutory language, uh, the provisions identified in the program, and answers some of the most basic and frequent questions that we received. And it provides a little bit more level of detail than what's in the statutory text. And lastly, it includes a request for expressions of interest, which Amit had discussed under uh, his presentation, from entities who are interested in uh, putting forward potential corridors. And then later on this year, uh, FRA will solicit initial proposals for entry into the program. And we will support the selection of corridors for development under the program and provide additional guidance on program structure and proposal requirements. So, FRA has done substantial outreach about this effort to date. On February 7th, we issued a request for information seeking input into the establishment of the program. We received over 400 comments during the 30-day period. And during that time, we also conducted three virtual listening sessions with a total of 469 individuals in attendance across three sessions. 
We held three distinct listening sessions. First was with entities who are eligible to submit proposals under the program. We also had a session with the host railroads. And then lastly, we had a session with any other entity that's interested. And so at the onset of the program, FRA is looking to outline three key significant poly policy positions. First, selected corridors should not be purely speculative, and the level of non-federal commitment may be modest at the beginning, but must grow as a corridor advances through the program. Making a proposal doesn't mean the proposer is legally committed to following things through to operations. There will be lots of steps along the way to getting from uh, project planning all the way to implementation. Second, in the long term, corridor ID will be the primary mechanism for developing off Northeast Corridor intercity passenger rail corridors and projects for subsequent implementation. Corridor ID is intended to be a big tent program, from new services on new rail lines to the most modest capital improvements for existing services. And FRA will work with the entities on the scope of a service development plan and tailor that scope to the character of the selected proposal. Lastly, quarters and projects that advance into the project pipeline should be ready for immediate implementation. And so development activities under the quarter ID program will include the preparation of service development plans, as we noted, which include the identification of capital projects necessary to support a corridor and the advancement of such projects as appropriate through preliminary engineering and the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA process. We view that ready for implementation constitutes completing both the PE and NEPA stages. And the overall benefits to entities who are proposing include providing, FRA would provide funds to the, for completing both planning and PE and NEPA. We, you would get FRA on board and familiar with capital projects and thus avoiding kind of projects coming to FRA as a cold application per se. And additionally, quarter ID, entry in the quarter ID program and the projects themselves would have priority in the Fed State funding program. So where does uh, quarter ID fit into the overall scheme for inner city passenger rail development? It's probably worth describing where quarter ID is in relation to, proposed, to the proposed FRA project life cycle stages. And so for a little bit of background, on June 28th, FRA published a notice of proposed guidance on the development and implementation of railroad capital projects. FRA has identified the need to establish clear practices and procedures for the development and implementation of railroad capital projects to support many of the provisions laid out in the bipartisan infrastructure law. One of the items the guidance defines is the stages in the railroad capital project life cycle and project development process from inception to operation. And in this guidance, FRA proposes a model consisting of six stages, including systems planning, project planning, project development, final design, construction, and operation. And for context, both the Federal Highway Administration and the Federal Transit Administration have similar models to find project life cycle. So in the FRA program schema themes, where these items line up in terms of the project life cycle are at the onset with systems planning, uh, FRA has a unique role in the development of regional rail plans, and we'll discuss that a little bit later. But uh, we also provide oversight of state rail plans. And then if we go into the implementation stages, and for future programs, we view the Fed State Partnership and other federal funding programs for the completion of final design and construction. And finally, operation could be funded through restoration enhancement program. And the corridor ID program is intended to fill that gap between systems planning and final design to complete both project planning and project development for inner city passenger rail projects. And so as Amit mentioned, we are soliciting a request for expressions of interest at this time. That was part of the Federal Register notice included in the, in the May 13th document. And we wanted to clarify some of the, the minimal, some of the information regarding uh, that expression of interest. We are seeking very minimal amount of information from entities, We're primarily just looking for what are the endpoints of the corridor you're interested in pursuing and who is the contact information of the entity itself. And we view that the expressions of interest are key to initiating FRA outreach to interest eligible entities. Um, and again, these, these expressions of interest are non-binding, non-mandatory, and not subject to a deadline. But the administrator and the agency is encouraging submissions uh, sooner rather than later. And we view the expressions of interest as our opportunity to, to start the dialogue with entities who are interested in soliciting proposals. So walking through where we are in the quarter ID process right now, on November 15th, there was the enactment of the bipartisan infrastructure law. On May 13th, we had our establishment of the program. 
Later this year, we intend to publish the notice of quarter selection funding opportunity for the program. And then May 13th of next year, we are required to uh, submit our first report to Congress on the project pipeline. And then of September, or actually next month, I should say, at the AASHTO Council on Rail Transportation Conference, we intend to provide more information about the quarter ID program itself and what we are seeking from proposals and solicit feedback from uh, uh, program stakeholders. And for those who cannot attend uh, court in itself, we will also uh, follow up with a webinar within the week. So next steps with quarter ID. Again, I will hammer this into everyone's head. Submit expressions of interest. You do that through the regulations.gov uh, federal register docket notice on the link that I provided up here. And if anybody needs copies of this information, we can easily provide it for folks. Uh, we're also gonna have, again, program informational sessions, as I, as I mentioned, both at court and a public webinar. We will be, again, uh, uh, soliciting uh, submissions for the initial proposals later this year. And if there are any questions about the program itself, we do have a dedicated email address at FRA. It's paxraildev at dot.gov. And so with that, we'll turn it over to Katie to start you guys off on uh, our overview of the long distance study. Thank you, Lyle. So hi, I'm Katie List, uh, and I'm working with Lyle on FRA's Amtrak Daily Long Distance Study, which I feel like a lot of folks here are probably pretty familiar with. And you know, we're excited to be here today, but we'd also like to get a sense of where everyone here is coming from, quite literally. So we have an interactive activity to help us with that. So the first thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take out your phones. You can openly use them. Um, and follow the instructions on the screen to join our interactive activity. And you can see there's an instruction to text FRA feedback 982 to the number 22333 to join our interactive session. And you'll get a con confirmation text as soon as um, you're able to join. So I'll wait a minute for folks to send that. Has anyone gotten the confirmation text yet? Great. So now that you're in, um, the first question we have for you today is just, where are you joining us from? And you can text your response to the same number, 22333. And Kyla, can you bring up the poll everywhere screen? That's the first one. All right. Okay, we've got a lot of travel here today, which is great, including obviously some great representation from Billings, as well as the uh, Pacific Northwest. Uh, we'll run over to Minneapolis, some folks from Washington as well. All right, great. This is really helpful and kind of just great for us to know in general. So let me activate the next one. So in one word, how would you describe Amtrak's long distance routes? I know one word is a lot, so if you need to use two, uh, I understand. We'll just try and keep it to uh, a couple of words here. And you can text your response to the same number. Um, I'll give folks a minute to think about it, and then we can see what the responses are. Um, Kyla, can you bring up the uh, poll everywhere screen? Thank you. <coughs> oh, 
okay. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I should have said, you know, feel free to express your opinion, but I don't think I needed to. Uh, this is. There's a lot going on here. Um, I do see promising down there, so that's helpful. Okay, this is great. So we got a real mix of responses here. Obviously, we're seeing the word um, slow pop up a couple times. The, the more frequently a word is used, the more the larger it will be on the screen. Is there anything surprising to folks up here? Okay, well that is um, a really great way to kick things off. <laughs> um, and hopefully we'll be able to talk about more ways to provide feedback about um, long distance routes. So, now that you've, you've kind of got an idea of people's perception of them, what are long distance routes? They are actually defined in federal statute. They are routes that are um, 750 miles or longer operated by Amtrak. And the current long distance network has 15 routes with a really wide range of distances. If you look at the map, it's everything in green. Uh, there are 13 routes that provide daily service and two routes provide service three times a week. So as uh, Administrator Bose mentioned, this is not the first time that DOT has been tasked with examining long distance routes. Um, we were here from the beginning when Amtrak was established in 1970. Uh, as part of the process, USDOT published a report which designated the 21 city pairs between which Amtrak should operate. And over the next couple of years, Amtrak added, so, uh, Amtrak Congress requested that Amtrak add several more routes. So that's the initial report from 1971. Jumping ahead to 1978, uh, Congress directed DOT to propose a restructured system. And through a series of reports, DOT ultimately recommended eliminating 40% of Amtrak's route miles. Um, a year later, Congress adopted some new criteria for route elimination it did preserve some routes, but the Amtrak route system was still reduced by 20%. So for the next 25 years, the system saw some additional cuts, including eliminating services, truncating routes, and reducing frequencies. And most recently, in 2008, um, Congress directed Amtrak uh, to study service restoration opportunities on three of the discontinued routes. Uh, the Pioneer, the North Coast Hiawatha, and the Gulf Coast Service. So, you know, as you can see, long distance service reductions over the past 40 years have resulted in some communities losing transportation options, as well as all of the economic and social benefits that go with those connections. And as we just saw, um, some of those previous studies were really focused on restructuring or frankly, reducing service. And the Amtrak Daily Long Distance Service Study uh, as required by Congress under the infrastructure law really intends to move away from this trend of focusing on service reduction and instead lay the initial framework for an expanded and interconnected long distance passenger rail network. So the, I think folks here are probably pretty familiar with the language in the infrastructure bill, but it does say that we should conduct a study to evaluate restoration of daily inner city passenger service along any discontinued Amtrak route or any Amtrak routes that don't operate daily. The study also directs us to look at potential new long distance Amtrak routes, focusing on routes that were in service before 1971, but weren't continued by Amtrak. There's a lot of text here, apologies. Um, but uh, just to give you an overview of what 
the study is required to include. So we'll get into a little more detail later into the presentation, but as written in the infrastructure bill, um, the study should evaluate options for restoring or enhancing routes, select preferred options for that restoration or enhancement, develop a prioritized inventory of capital projects, recommend ways that Amtrak and communities can work together to improve the use of service and identify funding sources. The final report will also include an estimate of cost and public benefits for each relevant route. The infrastructure bill also includes a substantial and very critical list of groups that FRA is required to consult with. Um, I think, <clears throat> I won't read through the whole list right here, but um, you know, it, it was very clear about um, the, some of the stakeholders that we should be engaging with. So FRA will establish working groups or other forums to consult with stakeholders, and we expect to engage with those groups throughout the duration of the study. And uh, as is fairly clear, the potential stakeholders for the study very likely cover the entire country. <laughs> so there will have to be some different approaches, um, including some strategies to address national stakeholders as well as for more regional ones that can focus on some of the root specific issues. Again, a lot of text, but the point of this is to say the long distance study is not exists in a vacuum. Um, this is, is other um, provisions of the infrastructure bill that relate to it, including the corridor ID program, which Lyle already talked about. Uh, the definition of corridors in that program includes routes formerly operated by Amtrak, as well as increasing frequency on long distance routes. The Federal State Partnership for Inner City Passenger Rail Grants, which has a funding reserve for long distance, as well as a provision that actually limits the discontinuance of existing long distance routes. <coughs> One more slide of text. Um, so we believe the study serves several purposes, which we've outlined in a very preliminary vision for the study. First, it will identify a common long-term vision for long distance passenger rail service and the projects needed to implement that. And this is based on current and future demand as well as the role of long distance services in linking communities across the country. It will also identify some institutional arrangements, financial requirements, and planning needed for that vision. And then identify strategies for Amtrak and stakeholder coordination in developing and implementing that long distance routes. So this is a really big study. Um, and when we talk about the process, it's really helpful to have I, we think to have a framework of what the study is and what the study isn't so we can really focus on the really big and great things we want to accomplish through this. So this slide li lays out some of the key elements of what the study is and what it isn't. Um, it does focus on long distance routes, um, <coughs> which means you know it's not a national rail plan. It's looking at routes that are over 100 and 750 miles, so it's not an assessment of state supported services. Um, in the name of the provision, it has the word Amtrak, so we're focusing on Amtrak as the service provider. We're also looking at service frequencies to meet the identified long distance markets, so that means it's not necessarily you know, a high frequency express corridor study. It will assume similar existing equipment, um, customer product profiles um, as existing service, so we're not going to be really digging into new customer products <coughs> or equipment types. Um, we're going to be looking at utilizing existing rail corridors, not um, green fields, and also, you know, for the most part, conventional rail and technology. So this is not a study for high-speed rail or, you know, emerging technologies. So I, I know this is, I, I hear some sighs. Um, you know, it, it's good to 
kind of lay out what the study is and isn't, and but there will be a lot of opportunities for um, you know, stakeholder engagement and letting FRA and everyone know kind of what you think and how we should and how we're uh, approaching this moving forward. So with that, I will hand it back to Lyle, who's going to give more details on the scope as well as stakeholder engagement. Thanks, Katie. So tying the long distance study uh, back to the project life, life cycle stages that I introduced in another quarter ID presentation. Again, these are the six stages that <clears throat> we've proposed to uh, develop projects from inception all the way to operation. We outlined where do the FRA uh, more or less funding programs align with these development stages and so we wanted to also highlight where we think the long distance study fits in. And so the long distance study is both a systems planning and a project planning effort. From a systems planning perspective, the long distance study will complete an analysis of empirical data to identify rail transportation needs and to develop strategies and projects to meet those needs. From a project planning perspective, the long distance study will complete the necessary planning analysis to identify a prioritized inventory of capital projects. And so we're gonna switch gears a little bit and uh, talk about a couple other topics as it relates to engagement strategies now. And so first we wanna walk through the proposed long distance study scope of work and identify what tasks uh, engagement may occur. And that's not to say that engagement will not occur throughout the whole process, but there are several tasks where engagement is key. And then secondly, we're gonna talk about and present potential engagement strategies in which FRA can incorporate at the onset of the study process, looking at our regional rail plan efforts as an example. And so, for many of you, you've seen this. This is our draft scope of work for the long distance effort. And we thought it'd be important to walk through these tasks and describe a little bit more detail about what they entail and then where key engagement points would occur. So, task one is our development of a detailed work plan. That's more or less an administrative task with our project uh, contractor. Second would be the agency stakeholder and public engagement task. That's gonna identify the who, the what, the when and where of engagement activities that will occur through the process itself. Uh, task three is our assessment of previous long distance services. And so this is the historical assessment component of the, the study itself, where, where FRA will analyze and assess all relevant discontinued Amtrak services that meet the statute requirements under 22214. As we identified earlier, there's essentially three types of services. You know, first there's the assessment of discontinued services. And so uh, FRA intends to assess those, th those existing services that were in regular scheduled service as part of that effort and not in intended to focus on Amtrak services that may have operated for limited durations or were implemented to address special circumstances. So we preliminarily have identified 14 quarters that meet this definition uh, for, for the effort, which includes services like the North Coast Hiawatha, the Pioneer, the Desert Wind, the Floridian, and the Hilltopper. Uh, the second category is the assessment of long distance routes in service pre-Amtrak uh, of April 1971. And then lastly, it's, uh, we are required to assess non-daily services. And so as noted today, that's the Cardinal and Sunset Limited. Uh, under task four, we're gonna do an assessment of the current long distance service uh, services that exist today and also provide an assessment of the travel market and get a better sense of the travel demand and demographic information of uh, potential communities that would benefit from these type of services. Task five, six, and seven, I'll go into to detail on the next slide uh, in substantial more detail, but that's really the meat of the effort where we're gonna be developing kind of tools and methodologies to assess the long distance services and developing concepts and then uh, recommendations for preferred options to move forward. Uh, task eight is our cost benefit. Uh, benefits and financing task, and under that, FRA will develop a range of cost and financial analyses to assess each recommended long distance service and for a larger interconnected long distance network. We'll develop cost estimates that will include capital costs, operating financial forecasts, and a public benefit analysis. And we will also develop a financial plan with discussions of potential funding and finance strategies for recommended long distance services. 
And task nine is where FRA will develop recommendations for methods by which Amtrak could work with local communities and organizations to develop activities and programs to continuously improve public use of inner city passenger rail service along long distance routes. And we will evaluate gaps in current institutional, regulatory, financial, political, and governance structures that inhibit this collaboration and by extent the ability to develop, operate, and maintain and fund an enhanced long distance service network. And task 10 and 11 are essentially the deliverables of the effort itself, the draft study and a final version of the study. And I would be remiss to note that through this process, we've identified potentially two uh, spots where we might consider uh, proposing interim reports. So first would be after kind of the historical assessment, of what we're looking at, so that's after task four. And then we propose to do also maybe an interim report after we have identified the uh, initial concepts that we're gonna study. And so where do we think key engagement pieces would occur? First, and as we'll talk about today, is really getting feedback about how we do engagement and what opportunities there are to, to, to participate in the study. Uh, second, I'll walk you through again on the next slide in more detail how engagement may occur through the actual identification of the services themselves and uh, identifying the, the screening and methodology to come to preferred options. And then lastly, we also seek, we're probably be seeking engagement on recommendations to move uh, the services forward. And so, task four, five, and six, as I mentioned, are kind of the, the key aspects of the study itself. So under uh, task five, which is our methodology and tools, we'll develop these tools to support the framework of assessing the expansion and improvement of Amtrak long distance services. These methodologies and tools will be used to assess the validity of proposed long distance services and the identification of preferred options for restoring, exp expanding, or enhancing services. These tools will ultimately fulfill the requirement of developing a prioritized list of capital projects and other actions necessary to restore or enhance, including cost estimates. <clears throat> from, an in excuse me, from an analytical perspective, we'll first start off with the initial network option analysis. And this is kind of our big tent, let's look at the country as a whole and where can we, we can connect communities. So FRA will assess initial network design options that will describe the communities to be served by the long distance network and the rail corridors that would, be, that would host long distance services. These would be developed based on opportunities identified in the baseline conditions and market assessment. And FRA will develop Im implementation options that span over several horizon years to include near-term, mid-term, and long-term concepts. And this task really aligns with that systems planning concept that I outlined earlier under our project life cycle stages. Moving to the next level of analysis, we get into our route options analysis, which is where FRA will assess route options using the study's established methodology and tools. And FRA will consider the anticipated operating requirements to identify the route options that are to be carried forward for further analysis and dismiss those that do not satisfy the methodology criteria. Going to the one step further, we would <clears throat> start our service options analysis and this is where FRA will assess service options based on the route options carry forward and develop potential viable service and operating options for long distance services. Service plan concepts describe the range of train services uh, in connecting markets in the network and the concepts for how these services would operate and interact in the network. So this task is really looking at the service itself, the frequencies, the stopping pattern, the capacity, um, and, what, and, so, and whatnot. In conducting the service option analysis, FRA will consider the anticipated operating requirements specified for each long distance service and identify which service options may be carried forward for further analysis and refinement. As I noted previously, this is where we would hope to, to publish an interim report that has basically uh, identifies what we've done to date. So at this point, we would potentially publish uh, a report that has the routes and potential services that we're considering. And then the next task, after the interim report is really our investment options analysis. And under this task, FRA will develop and assess potential packages of physical improvements along these routes that could achieve the operational requirements specified for each long distance service and identify which investment options will be uh, recommended to be carried forward and which will be screened out and dismissed. The investment option analysis will consider the potential phased implementation of physical investments both in the development of the investment options and in determining which will be carried forward for further analysis. The investment option analysis will be supported by conceptual level engineering and will result in an inventory of capital project and, cap and <clears throat> capital cost estimates. 
So this is where we're really identifying what kind of infrastructure is necessary to actually implement uh, the services themselves. And finally, we're gonna, at the end of that process, go back and do a uh, final network options analysis assessment. So tasks uh, 61, 62, 63, and 71 are really kind of project planning level tasks. And 72 is really reassessing where we are from a network planning perspective. And so under that, uh, we will list the, the final list of routes that were determined to be carried forward. And the analysis will describe the communities to be served by an enhanced and integrated long distance network, the means for reconnecting them, and assess the routes from a network perspective. The analysis will also provide a prioritized inventory of capital projects and other actions that are required to restore or enhance the service and the associated costs and additional needs for each proposed capital improvement. The prioritization plan will also serve as a blueprint for the long distance network based on analysis and views from the study. And so under this concept, we've identified kind of the key areas of engagement. And really it's most of them. Uh, I will say under the investment option analysis, that is much more of a technical task that will primarily be conducted probably with consultation with the host railroads and Amtrak themselves. But we will probably seek input from uh, other stakeholders as well. But the key ones where we want feedback on and expect are in these methodologies, the initial network, the route and service, and the final network options. And so, <clears throat> switching a little bit of a different, uh, to a different topic on this, is we want to, probably we want to discuss potential engagement strategies to, to move the study forward. And so we thought it would be important to focus on strategies, strategies that we've identified in our previous regional rail planning efforts. And we thought there was a good nexus between those efforts and the long distance study itself. So regional rail plans share much of the similar outcomes and processes as proposed for the long distance study. And so we thought it would be important to walk you through uh, these regional rail plans themselves in a little bit of detail and then describe some of those engagement uh, strategies that we've used uh, in those processes and may want to consider through the long distance study. So first, what is a regional rail plan? Uh, a regional rail plan identifies a potential long-term vision for a multi-state intercity passenger rail network. A regional rail plan study process analyzes existing conditions, projections of future travel demand, and the optimal role of passenger rail service within a multimodal transportation context. The study process is intended to serve as a visioning exercise for stakeholders to lay the groundwork for future high-performance rail development concepts. Many federal and state passenger rail planning activities have focused on either one, individual quarters between major cities, or two, comprehensive rail planning within individual states. Regional rail studies demonstrate that developing rail plans within the context of a broader regional outlook provides several benefits, including better integration of rail projects with other transportation modes, promotes the greater involvement by stakeholders and builds consensus. It identifies priorities that support both the logical sequencing of developing networks and efficient use of limited funds and yields more cost-effective investments. So the first uh, regional rail plan study that was led by FRA was the Southwest Multi-State Regional Rail Planning, or Multi-State Rail Planning Study that was completed in 2014. Representatives from key transportation organizations across Arizona, California, Nevada, Colorado, New Mexico, and Utah worked through the challenges of developing multi-state rail plans and outlined a common preliminary technical vision for high-performance rail in the Southwest as part of the study. The study demonstrated an analytical framework for developing early stage high-performance rail network planning concepts and examining the institutional context for establishing and implementing a long-range rail vision. In summer 2016, FRA kicked off the Southeast Regional Rail Planning Study to explore the potential for a high-performance multi-state inner-city passenger rail network in the states of Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida, plus the District of Columbia. During the study, states were awarded funding to establish a regional governance body, resulting in the establishment of the Southeast Corridor Commission in 2020. The Southeast Corridor Commission adopted the Southeast Regional Rail Planning Study as the framework to guide their work developing the Southeast Rail Network. The Southeast Regional Rail Plan was completed in early 2021 and adopted by the uh, Southeast Commission. And lastly is the Midwest Regional Rail Planning Study, which we started in the spring of 2017 and built on rail planning efforts within 12 states in the Midwest, I won't name all of them, <laughs> and was intended to support both state rail planning efforts and the coordinated planning and an implementation of new and approved passenger rail services within the region. 
In October 2021, the final report of the study was released jointly by FRA and the Midwest Interstate Passenger Rail Commission, also known as MIPRIC, an inter which is an interstate rail compact formed to promote cor and coordinate and support regional improvements to passenger rail services. So one uh, engagement strategy that we've done through these regional studies is having FRA establish uh, stakehold stake out, uh, sorry, stakeholder outreach objectives. And so this is an example where FRA has established objectives on how we intend to do stakeholder outreach in a regional rail planning context. And so I can walk through these, but uh, I'll just mention a few of them briefly. Some of them is we work directly with the states in implementing. We, we coordinated with implementing and jurisdictional partners and we created an avenue for all parties to provide input through in-person meetings, webinars, and uh, the project website. Another key aspect of this effort is uh, establishing stakeholder planning groups. And so in the Midwest and in the Southeast, we had one regional stakeholder group where we identified lead stakeholders. In this case, it was typically the states and potentially uh, a rail commission if they were uh, eligible at the time. And we also identified other key stakeholders uh, to, to represent a diverse group of in interest in the effort. And we also had other interested parties uh, that we kept informed through the process that maybe were not directly involved in stakeholder meetings per se, but were able to listen in and provide feedback, whether that's through the project website or through other activities. And so for the long distance study, FRA intends to have these stakeholders uh, that would represent the broad set of stakeholders identified under section 22214. It would not just be uh, the states that we've done through the regional efforts. We've also identified goals and principles of engagement for our stakeholders uh, through these processes. And so we believe that goals and guiding principles can serve as a foundation for major activities, anchoring them to the mission and goals of the study. Their purpose is to keep participants on track while ensuring uh, key themes and incorporate, and that they are incorporated throughout the process. Uh, here are some uh, key examples, and I won't walk through each one, but here's another concept to consider as we uh, start the process. Lastly, we've also worked with stakeholder groups to develop group charges. And so this is where we're basically asking, what are we asking of stakeholder groups, and what are the roles of the stakeholder groups in the process? And so working with these groups themselves, we've identified you know, key pieces of information that we are uh, looking to seek input on. And then lastly, another concept to consider is uh, how to structure these stakeholder working groups. And so in the first, first one, uh, our experience has been to basically outline how, this, how the study process is going to uh, uh, go underway. You know, we talk about the background, we identify the roles and responsibilities of everybody involved, the purpose and the outcomes, we go over the work plan and timeline, um, and really talk about how we introduce the study. And so. As part of that too, we also seek some outcomes. We wanna make sure that everybody understands the process and, it, and um, the inputs into the process. And we also want FRA to understand how stakeholder priorities uh, are to be considered and what limitations stakeholders may have. And so with that in mind, we will turn it back to our uh, polling question. And so we presented a lot of stakeholder engagement strategies, but we thought it'd be worth uh, asking uh, the group here today you know, what goals or principles should be established for stakeholder engagement in the long distance study effort? So uh, we ask that you'll text your response to 22333. And we'll pull up the feedback screen in just a little bit. a lot of comments related to equity, inclusion, transparency. Great, and you know, those are guiding principles that a lot of the other regional rail plan efforts have utilized uh, to move those programs forward. Enjoy the emojis too, thank you for those. <laughs> All right, maybe we can go back to the presentation and we're pretty much done, we just have one more slide. 
And so where are our future engagement opportunities right now? So tomorrow I'm flying to Louisville, Kentucky to present um, the long distance study to the National Transportation Indian Country Conference. As Katie noted under consultation, you know, we, we are required to do a wad, large swath of uh, consultation through this effort, including uh, uh, con consulting federally recognized tribes. And so this is the biggest conference in the country to actually engage uh, those entities. So we'll be presenting with them on Wednesday. It's very introductory. This presentation has a lot more information that you guys received today. And then similarly to the quarter ID program, we intend to do a introductory presentation and workshop at, at the um, court conference in Kansas City, Missouri uh, on the 22nd of September. I will say we, you know, once we have our support on board, we intend to hit the ground running and we will intend to schedule stakeholder engagement opportunities as soon as possible, both virtually and in person. So all that is to be determined, but hopefully by the end of this year, we will actively have more informal engagement with many of the folks in the room here today and with other folks who are interested in the study. So with that, I think that's our presentation. All right. Thank you so much, Lyle. And so we are out of time for this session. Uh, as luck would have it, though, our friends with FRA will be around for the rest of today and all of tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, we will have a dedicated session looking at uh, uh, these very issues related to the long distance study, public engagement, and soliciting all of your ideas for how that might uh, look as the months uh, go forward. Here. And the, the last thing, I, I apologize, those are our contact information for both the quarter ID program and the long long distance uh, study itself. So paxraildev at dot.gov if you have any questions for quarter ID and long distance study at dot.gov for the long distance study itself. Thank you, Lyle. Uh, so we'll take a short break. Before we do though, and five minute break, so a little bit shorter this time, come back at the top of the hour, we will get started promptly.